16 of the uh, webinar series that we've been conducting over COVID. Uh, Jordy and I are going to be on today. Susanna couldn't make it, so uh, we're going to have the discussion between ourselves. Uh, today's topic, thanks to Greg Evans, was uh, suggested uh, last week, and we're going to uh, work through some uh, interesting aspects of vacation properties and advising clients regarding the succession of vacation properties. I know, Jordy, you have some of your own special thoughts and your own special clauses that you consider using with uh, vacation property transfers, and we want to talk about that and some of the general ideas. Uh, after the podcast, after the webinar, we're going to post under our COVID resources an article and uh, a brochure that you'll have. So uh, the materials that we are going to discuss today are going to be uh, available. Um, so we, without further ado, we'll head into the uh, webinar this morning. Everyone just needs to mute and to uh, turn off their video uh, so that we can keep the stream going strong. And then um, you'll have to ignore the fact that you may hear a barking dog behind me because I am doing this webinar, uh, luckily, at my cottage. So <laughs> the uh, setup is a little uh, <coughs> less formal. Um, Okay, so Jordy, uh, let's start off with why don't you just give some of your general observations, and I'll just make the point that there's a uh, Peter Lillico, who is one of the Canadian experts and leading experts on uh, transfer cottages in this specific area, has uh, written a lot on this area, and uh, there's a couple of resources that he's pulled from. One of the interesting stats was that uh, almost one in ten Canadians owns a vacation property, and of that figure, the majority, an estimated 81%, intend to leave the property to family members upon death, notwithstanding the uh, fact that they probably haven't thought through the problem. Uh, an interesting stat that Peter Lillico brings up in his one of his resources is that in the Muskoka Halliburton area for Ontario, for example, the property values, the median values for waterfront properties in 1988 went from $111,000 in 1998 to 459000 in 2018. So that's a dramatic step uh, up, and uh, obviously that creates with it uh, big tax burdens and uh, some other unnecessary or sort of un unforeseen uh, problems. So, Jordy, uh, we're going to talk today about some of the ideas and the techniques that we use and also uh, some of the clauses that you use. And as I say, the three documents that we're going to make sure that are up on the online after this is going to be a brochure that we have outlining some of the things we discussed today, an article that Suzanne and I have written, and a draft family uh, agreement, a sharing agreement um, that might be of some help for the resources. So before we go any further, again, ask everyone to just mute your phone. We're just getting some background uh, from someone. And, uh, and then, Jordy, over to you to start this discussion. Thanks, Ian. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, cottages, I don't own a cottage, so I have no, uh, this and pets, I, I just don't, I don't understand. But um, so, you know, I, I always say the best solution to, to this is just, you know, a localized fire that will destroy the cottage before they have to pass it on to their kids. Because uh, all of the solutions that we, uh, and I call them solutions, but really they're options, all of those options are, uh, have their own particular difficulties and uh, uh, downsides. There's no uh, perfect solution to this issue because the, uh, the goal, I guess, of the client is that the cottage continue in the family uh, uh, basically the same way they enjoy it, um, which, of course, it's it, the problem is that you have more than one. If you have more than one person that you're giving it to, it will never work the same way. Uh, the reason it works for the for the for the client is because they're the only owner. Um, after that, it doesn't work so well, but we do have some options. So um, I don't know, if, Ian, you want to start with some, throw out some options, or do you want me to run through them? Well, let's, let's start with uh, the, the, the one that you're sort of touching on, and that is the importance of a family discussion at the outset. Um, this is a planning step that, quite frankly, I think all estate planning requires a good family discussion. But um, 
if you're going to have a unique property, and it doesn't have to be a cottage, any unique property, someone says, look, I've always wanted that Chagall um, that, you know, is, is a, an outstanding asset in the, in the, in the uh, estate or something of, of consequence like that. These, these uh, transitions of uh, these properties done without any discussion seems to me to be uh, you're creating your own problems and, and that's fine. I mean, maybe you want it and you, maybe you, you don't want to face the music. Your clients, I mean, don't want to face the music, but you know, for vacation properties, some of the early questions I'll ask the clients is, did they intend the beneficiaries? Uh, are they currently using the property? Uh, are the intended beneficiaries planning to use the property in the future? So a classic example is I've got kids in their early twenties and no one's married and nobody has kids, but there's an there's a, a theory in their mind that one day they will use this cottage with their kids. Um, so that those are the kinds of, you know, maybe you open up the discussions as you're creating your estate plan with your client and that. Whether the client wishes to leave the vacation property to one or more than one family member. An important discussion. Sometimes, you know, until you have this discussion, I find my clients are like, oh, yeah, I know they want to share it. And then they actually have the discussion and they go, well, Betty didn't even want it. Uh, I was shocked, but that's fine. Um, I'm glad I asked sort of thing. Uh, the personal, uh, whether the client can personally afford to bear the tax liability relating to the transfer of the property or general upkeep of the property is a huge factor to consider. And we'll talk about, Jordy, some of the clauses you use, the specific clauses you use to accommodate that. Um, does the client wish the vac vacation property to be um, passed on with some sort of mini trust or sufficient assets to support it. Does one family member uh, receiving the property get, does the other one get an equivalent gift of some, you know, equalization, so to speak, in the will? And, you know, ultimately, uh, those kinds of, um, uh, you know, expenses, uh, payments, and those kinds of uh, equalization questions can be uh really uh, worthwhile having that discussion with your, your your clients so they can go back and have that discussion with their family. And sometimes you may need to be part of that in terms of facilitating those discussions. So um, I guess the, uh, the opening uh, methodology to attract uh, a solution is in the classic one, and it doesn't fit all because not everyone is necessarily in a position to do this, but the classic scenario is is that what are we going to do about the heavy burden of tax that is going to be hit within 18 months or so of the date of death <laughs> and what tools exist to fund that are typically a life insurance uh, tool that is um, one of the most uh, you know uh, practical solutions from a standpoint and and often people will say well look it's too late i can't get insurance and and then I'll say, well, look, just go check because sometimes you'll find you might have a possibility of a joint last to die policy you could get with your spouse. So your insurability may not be as grim as you think it is. Uh, obviously, we're not in the insurance selling business, but it's um, uh, a tool that doesn't require lawyering. It requires uh, some suggestions and some passing on of some advice to uh, your client. Uh, but, Jordy, the inter vivos transfers is really where um, things start to get uh a little more complicated and then of course you can create intervivalist trusts um, you can talk about joint tenancy gifts by will those kinds of tools so um, and finally not finally but another tool is of course a co-ownership agreement uh, so Jordy those are some of just an overview comments and then why don't you start in with some of the specifics of the transfer tools that you uh, consider um, yeah so the way I always think of it is there's really I'm a big believer in limited options. So uh, there's really two choices. Either they sell it or the beneficiaries uh, get to use it together, share it. Sell it or share it. Um, and then within each of those, of course, there's whole kinds of options. But um, so the simple one, right, where you say, look, um, uh, on my death, I want it sold because um, I want the, the value split among my beneficiaries. So that's option one. So selling it on death. And then the issue becomes, okay, do I uh, sell it? Who, do I, who am I allowing you to sell it to? And um, that's the big issue because sometimes the best solution is that it can be sold to anybody other than one of the beneficiaries because 
at the end of the day, and, and those of you who have cottages will understand this better than I, but at the end of the day, if only one kid gets the cottage, whether they get it as a transfer or, as a, or they buy it or whatever, at the end of the day, if only one kid ends up with it, then there's always the, the option, the, the feeling that could be there that, you know, it's, it, it went to that person. It's their cottage. It's not my cottage. It's the other kid. And that can be a very bad feeling for many people. Um, and notwithstanding that, you know, oh, you know, John bought it. He used his money. Yeah, but it's his, he got it. He got the cottage. And so sometimes the solution is, look, oh, I don't want that feeling. That was our cottage. Now you guys get your own cottages and create your own a life with them and sell it to a third party other than the beneficiary. So that really, I think, is the big fundamental question. Because notwithstanding, you know, fairness is in the eye of the beholder, and notwithstanding that you've set up whatever mechanism you you can to sh ensure that the the, per the person who ends up with it has paid paid for it in essence, you still are left with that feeling that when the other kid drives by, it's not their cottage, and it used to be it used to be their cottage. So that's, you know, I think a fundamental, and maybe Ian, you can speak to that emotion part of it, of, of that option. Well, that's right. And, and, you know, I mean, look, at some level, the emotions, my dad used to say, we don't wear the right collar to solve those problems. And um, there's only so much we can do. It, it has to be a bit of a clinical process. Uh, and as you say, you want to simplify it. I agree. Seller share is, is a, is a, you know, simplified approach for sure. Um, but you, I want to try to take the emotions out as best I can, but I also want to give some practical suggestions. And, and, and one of the things that, uh, uh, you know, can drive it, of course, is, is that no one can afford the, tax, the capital gains payment. So it kind of economically works itself out. Uh, but in, in terms of specific tools, um, sometimes, uh, Jordy, of course, we just did one together with a client where uh, we set up an arrangement where the, the will provided that um, there's, they've got two years. The estate will pay the expenses for two years, and then the family's got two years to figure out what's going to happen. In some ways, that's a, probably a, a great solution in the sense that it, it makes people act like adults, but under no economic pressure uh, to make that decision rapidly. Right, and that's, that's certainly one of those co combinations. Um, where there, you know, the options of share and sell are combined. So there's the share for a period of time uh, to allow the parties to figure it out, to see if they can come up with their own way. Um, and that's the share. And then at the end of that period, if they can't work it out in some other way, there's a sell. Um, and, and again, um, you know, we, we talk about the sale option that often is what ends up happening um, because like you say, one one person wants it more than the other or one's in Canada and one's in the US and you know, all those kinds of things. So those all kind of um, work themselves out in some sense. But the, um, but the, so at the end of the day, most of the time, um, cottages are sold in that sense, that one person ends up with them. So I want to maybe take you through some of the decision making on that sort of uh, on the on that uh, scenario. So let me just uh, share my screen here. Um, so um, there we go. So here's um, a situation where we're um, uh, we we've got a cottage. We want it to go to the kids with, for some period of time. So we're using this hybrid um, approach. So we create a trust. And um, the kids can use it. And here's the key, right? Is the termination of this trust. So, um, some common situations, especially if you've got younger children. Look, I want to wait. If I pass away before they're all 25, I want to wait until they're all 25. Um, uh, as an example, uh, to give them all the ability to reach a stage of life where they can make a decision. Um, so that's one option. Another option is, look, I want to hold it for a couple of years. Um, you know, maybe it's not the fifth anniversary, maybe it's the second anniversary, um, you know, um, of my death. Uh, or 
look, if the trustees, depending on how long these, these provisions are, um, or uh, how long the trust might run, you might also want to build in the ability of the trustee to say, look, if we're not keeping this cottage, we're selling it. Um, so that's uh, an issue, but then that goes obviously to the to the dog, um, who the trustee uh, is, because if one kid is the trustee and they're going to have the decision making power, that that in itself is going to cause a, a whole bunch of uh, issues. So, those are some examples of of the termination of use. So, for how how long are we going to hold that and let the people share it, let the kids share it? This is the share portion of the of the combo gift, in essence. Um, then. As is always the case when you've got a sharing situation um, where one person is not going to be the owner outright, you, you've got to worry about the expenses. And so, you know, what expenses are going to be borne by the uh, state uh, and what are going to be borne by the um, uh, by the beneficiaries? Um, and so, you know, here are some examples. You can add other examples uh, or other expenses that might not be on the list. But it's important to consider, of course, that and and what happens, you know, if there's a fight about expenses and who's determining the expenses. So whenever we have the share option, you know, we've got other other uh, ramifications. And Ian's going to talk about the co-ownership uh, uh, agreements that can be built in uh, and can work on that. Um, if the estate is paying the expenses, um, where is the money coming from? So if the estate was immediately distributable. Um, well, there's no money being held back to pay the expenses. So uh, important to think about using a, a, a separate fund if that's the case, um, rather than just saying, I'll oh, pay it out of the residue. If, if we're going to hold it for five years, um, we can't wind up that estate. So that might be an issue as well. Um, substitutional property, it's usually not the case in a cottage. You don't want them to buy a, another cottage and use that. Um, and the, the second component of the share sale is this idea of the option of purchase. So how are we going to sell it at the end of the day? And um, here are some of the decision making. Uh, so one option is what happens if one issue is what happens if more than one person wants to buy? Uh, can they buy it together? Uh, do we put an order of priority? This person then gets the first chance to buy, then this person, then this person. Or do we just uh, do a random selection where we say, uh, you know, if three people want to buy it, I'm just going to pick it out of the hat. They're the ones who can buy it. Um, that takes away some of the idea that somebody can outbid the other, which is a, another option that you go with sealed bid. So if three people want to buy it, everybody puts in a bid and uh, the highest bid goes to the highest bidder. So those are all different kind of options for resolving where you have more than one person who wants to buy it. Um, how the purchase price is going to be set. Uh, often it's fair market value, but of course your client can say, look, I want to set, I don't want that. I want to set uh, an amount that you can buy it at. Um, so there's no dispute about things, et cetera. Um, so that's an option there. Um, and if it's going to be fair market value, how is that fair market value going to be assessed? Is it going to be appraisals, uh, et cetera? Um, and Ian, jump in anytime you want on any of these. Um, well, no, this is so important. And this is where, you know, there's a couple of, we ought, we, t we started off with uh, having a family discussion, but a family discussion sometimes, I mean, doesn't work in every situation. This is so important that what you're going through because you're empowering the testator. You're saying to the testator, you have the ability to at least try to solve this problem. Don't just throw your hands up in the air and say, you know, let's see what happens. Uh, you can direct a business like uh, parameters in your will and the, and the things that you're covering, Jordy, are so important because, uh, you know, if you don't have that discussion with the client, then they, they often will just say, you know, well, I'll talk up to the kids and we'll figure it out. And that never goes anywhere. Or they'll often say they'll figure it out. And, and then, of course that doesn't go anywhere either. I mean, I'm not saying my whole practice, but I can tell you, a, a, you know, an un, unnecessarily large portion of my practice is driven by special assets like this, the cottage fight. And, uh, it seems to me that, you know, as lawyers, we can help direct them and they can create a business solution. And, and that business solution comes from 
the kinds of questions you're talking about and, and can be, you know, incorporated right in the will. So I, I just think that's such an, uh, that's an option that we can put to our client and carefully put to a client with, with, uh, you know, reviewing these, these kinds of uh, questions. I'll talk about the ownership agreement in a minute, but Jordy, you carry on. Right. So, um, it, you know, then, then the uh, question is, uh, you know, we're talking about setting the fair market value if that's the approach that they want. <laughs> Do we um, allow each of the benefit? One option that I uh, often see is um, the estate gets a valuation and then any of the other beneficiaries who don't agree with it or want to get their own can get their own at their own cost. Um, and um, so for at their cost, you know, within 30 days or something, um, and then we average them. Um, and then the, the next point on the purchase price is whether we're going to deduct something for notional commission or some other expenses or the appraisal costs or whatever else. Uh, so those are, uh, you can build in um, to the calculation of what is going to be the purchase price if we're going with the sale option to one of the beneficiaries. And if you um, have those options available with the client right at hand when you're taking your instructions, you can create this business arrangement for the cottage transfer pretty quickly, right, Jordy? I mean, that's the thing. Like, it's not an onerous task for the solicitor to, to get through this. If you have it in hand and the kinds of questions you need to ask in hand, uh, you know, you're not having to make it up as you go along because this is pretty detailed questioning. And... Uh, you know, lots of times a client will say to me, well, you know, what do you think? And sure, I'll, I'll give my two cents worth within the confines of an option. Uh, but that option, for example, on, on the valuation, that, that valuation quagmire can be a complete nightmare. And yet, you know, your suggestion is exactly, uh, you know, it might not work in every case, but it's a great idea. That is just say, fine, we'll do one from the estate. And if, no one, if the people don't buy it, then they can go get their own and then we'll average it out. That solves it. Eliminates yeah. the, you know, essentially eliminates the issue. Now, you know, eliminate is always a dumb word in law because there's always someone will come up with a way to get around whatever you've tried to set up. But, uh, you know, the more direction, the more kind of contractual, the more business-like you create the arrangement in the will, the more difficult it is for clients, uh, for the beneficiaries to get around it, A, legally, but B, morally. I mean, I always say we have the biggest law firm in Canada that does estate litigation because most people don't litigate over anything. And the more you give direction, the more leadership you're giving as a, uh, as a solicitor to your clients to help them manage through this in a business solution. Yeah. And, and, and what I also say is, look, if everybody agrees on some other way, then, then that works. I mean, they're not bound by this. This is, as I say to clients, this is a default. This is a default if they cannot agree this is going to solve, try to solve a dispute. It's a dispute resolution mechanism, um, you know. And and um, so that's why it's 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 good. And there's a fallback if they can't agree. Oh, our kid, my kids get along. They'll get along. Well, there's the kids and the spouses and maybe the grandchildren and all kinds of other people who are in there. And uh, it, we all know that. So I'm not going to um, belabor that point. Then there's the timing to uh, to exercise the option. So at what point you've got, okay, you get the purchase price and how long do you have to decide? Uh, you got 30 days and then you're gonna close within 30 days. And the proceeds from the sale, typically what happens is you're just, you know, you're not actually buying it. You're using your share of the estate to to buy it or a part of your, you know, or, or partially your share of the estate plus money. So the money that goes in, has gotta go in somewhere and it's typically goes to the residue, which is being split among all the kits. That's why we deal with it that way. And that is sort of how you build the, the sale part of the, um, of this, the combo. Uh, it's like a fast food, we got the combo there. Um, and just to show you what that's gonna look like, um, uh, I'll just generate that. Um, and of course, there are tweaks that People want to, you know, have a unique uh, solution to things, um, and that's, you know, that's fine too. But at least this gives, you know, this covers most of the options that you might have. So um, I'll just pull that up on my screen here. 
So here's the will, um, and here's that trust for the residents. Just give me one second. Sorry, I just had a whole bunch. Well, we sped we sped everything up. So hang on a second. <laughs> okay, so here's the trust that we just drafted. Um, so just to point out, you know, if you're using a, a specific gift of a of a property, it's a good idea to have a pin. Um, and it's a good idea to do a title search for um, to ensure that it's not, you know, you can't avoid probate on a first dealing or something like that, and then maybe recommend a secondary will. Um, so um, you've got, you know, who the cottage beneficiaries are, and here's the termination, right? So we had the date when all the cottage beneficiaries are 25, or the second anniversary of my death, or when the trustee uh, determines that it's no longer advisable to maintain the cottage. We built that part in, but you don't have to include that. Um, and um, basically, we've got them using it and allowing those cottage beneficiaries to use it um, during that period of time. And here's the expenses uh, are going to be paid by the estate out of a special fund. And of course, whenever you set up a special fund, you have to concern yourself with what happens to the excess money um, it, and you know where does it go and things like that. So important to consider that about what happens with any amount left. Typically that just falls back into the residue. Um, and But note that whenever, and this is an important drafting clause, I'm just gonna blow this up a little bit bigger. Whenever you have a postponement of a fund, so in other words, you're holding for a period of time, um, and then there's a, you want it to just basically be distributed at the end of that period in, in accordance with the residue provisions. Important to what I call step up the date because the date that you want to determine the beneficiaries of the residue is not the date of your death, but now the date of that fund being terminated. So you can see that um, automatically we draft that so that it says distributed in part in accordance with the residue. But when we're talking about the distribution of this fund, when we talk about the date of death, make it the cottage disposition date. So that's the idea. That's what I mean by stepping up. And it's important whether it's a fund for expenses or a trust fund for a client, uh, for a beneficiary or a Henson trust or any kind of trust uh, that you're, you basically want to do a gift over to the residue, you want to do it as of the, the date, uh, determine the beneficiaries as of the date of that, um, of the windup of the trust. And so that was the, that was the share portion. This is the uh, portion that's the, uh, um, the sale portion. So I'm just going to blow that. So we're granting an option here on the following terms to all of the children, right? Um, and we're saying t we pick two valuations um, and averaging them. Um, and then here we have the provision that if any of the beneficiaries um, uh, who uh, don't, don't agree with it, they can get their own. Um, and so that's fine. Um, and then we have a, um, a basically an average here, less the com commission. Um, and they had a certain period of time to decide whether they want it. Here is the provision we had just, they buy it as equal tenants in common. If they both, if more than one wants to buy it, we had that as the option. But again, this is where you put in, if you're giving a priority and a, a first right of first refusal or a, or a random selection or a high bidder, you put in there. Um, and basically then uh, upon the, the transfer, um, it, it, uh, it just falls into the residue of the estate. Um, this is 2.9 I just want to address here. This is the idea that you don't have to pay cash for it. Um, so if your share, you can use, you can set aside your share and use your share um, of, of the uh, estate. Um, so we try to do that uh, if you can. Now that may not avoid land transfer tax, but it just makes, if you can, you can, but probably doesn't. Um, so, uh, and that's that's basically what we've uh, what we've done for the residents of the cottage trust for kids. Yeah, that that clause in there about that you can use your share is so important because uh, it makes a clear direction for the uh, beneficiaries. Sometimes it's an obvious move, but uh, sometimes you need to put it in to uh, ensure that people understand the consequences of these uh, funding mechanisms. Um, so, Jordy, in, in addition to your uh, uh, 
testamentary contract that you've set up for us, your tools that you've put into the will. Um, you mentioned earlier that there are, of course, and we're going to put this up on our, on our COVID resources, uh, a cottage ownership agreements that can exist. And we'll, we'll put a precedent up, but our precedent by no means is the only answer, but it's a, it just sets out some parameters. I usually have a few uh, sort of defining whereas clauses to set out who the parties are and what properties we're dealing with. I'll deal with the day-to-day -day expenses in the agreement. Uh, basic you expenses. Me, uh, am I screening in just so people can see? I've got a sample of one up here. Oh, great. Like that? Yeah. That'd be great. And we'll get this up uh, live too. I just sent it to Quinn, who's going to put it up. Yeah. Um, so there's my agreement right there that we're working from. You can see then I've, I, I want to define some terms, set the parameters of the parties and who's involved. Uh, set up set up what the properties we're dealing with then i move through the day-to-day -day expenses and the definition of basic expenses is is pretty straightforward but then i uh, we also include in there not uh, i we include in there the personal expenses uh definition and also extraordinary expenses and i think that's a really important one extraordinary expenses is one that people uh, tend to grapple with and and sometimes argue over uh, and so the more you can sort of describe it and, and put it in as a, as a defined term, um, uh, the better. The payment of the expenses itself, I, this, this document anticipates creating a management committee that will fix the amount to be paid by each of the owners on an annual basis. And then, uh, then any extraordinary expenses will be paid within the time, certain time period of the expenses being incurred. So you can see this is a real... Uh, uh, defined and uh, principled way of dealing with payments for the uh, cottage as a co-owner agreement. The next aspect of it, of course, and the one that can get a, uh, difficult or spicy in some ways is occupation. So we've got a clause in there about uh, dealing with the occupation uh, of the property and um, the rights to occupy, the timing and so forth. We've got a clause creating a management committee itself uh, and that's something that we I'll, I'll typically recommend that uh, it rolls. It doesn't get run by the same person all the time if we can. Uh, sale or transfer by a co-owner is, is anticipated, and that's something that if someone wants to get out of the deal, so to speak, so there's some provision there uh, and provision there to deal with the death of a co-owner. If you look at this document itself, you'll see that it's, it's akin to a shareholder's agreement, something that you would see uh, in a corporate scenario uh, for sure, some specific clauses relating to uh, spousal rights. But Clause 9, importantly, deals with arbitration of disputes, and um, this is uh, pretty generic the way we've set it up, but I've got one right now and I've, <laughs> it's great. We've got uh, two religious leaders that they both agreed that uh, they, they trust are going to be the ultimate arbitrators. So this will never see the light of day, of course, but it's going to be arbitrated uh, in a, um, uh, a unique uh, uh, scenario in a sense, but bound without rights of appeal and so forth. Um, there's a, uh, some sort of wind up clauses I would call. So anyway, that's just one uh, tool, one idea that um, we've used with some uh, success over the years in terms of trying to get people to, uh, if they're going to co-own, uh, enter into these types of share, share, uh, shareholder type arrangements. Um, Jordy, the uh, thing I was wondering is, uh, now we've, we've talked a little bit about um, uh, the tools that you use in the, in the drafting piece if we're going to create the contract. What are some of uh, our other options other than a, a transfer through will um, uh, with regard to cottage properties that you've used with some success? Well, um, so as far as, uh, you know, you can do it on death, obviously, and then um, you certainly know at that point that the owners, uh, the original owners don't need it anymore. Um, but there's the other uh, uh, option, which is an intervivos uh, disposition in some way. Um, so the um, you know the, the you have the same options in essence while you're alive. You can sell it and you can share it. Um, and uh, so you know one option is to sell it to uh, or give it to uh, one of the people that you want to get it. Um, that will of course, we all know that that 
you know, a transfer, uh, regardless of what you charge for it, um, uh, what the consideration is, is going to trigger uh, is a sale and trigger the deemed disposition of fair market value. And if it's not a principal residence, um, then it's going to uh, trigger uh, in capital gains and in income tax at that point. So that's one of the big, obviously, the big disadvantages uh, of an intervivos uh, sale or transfer is that it, it steps up, it speeds up the disposition date. Um, that can be good and bad. Uh, just to address, you know, it can be thought of as like a mini estate freeze in the sense that uh, you transfer it at now to someone else and then the gains uh, won't be triggered on death of the typically older person who was the owner previously uh, and now will you know, continue for some period of time. Now, I'm not sure that is a great solution, but um, it's you know, one, one point to make. The other issue, of course, is that if you transfer, the client has to be very careful because you know, they always say, oh, my kids will let me come up there. Um, but maybe Ian, you can address how that sometimes doesn't happen um, when, they, when you do these transfers. Sure, and these transfers tie into you know the you know, the joint tenancy is the classic one where they'll say, well, look, I'm going to put my uh, uh, kid on uh, on title with me, and uh, that'll uh, alleviate any transfer problems on death and so forth. And they think they're going to avoid probate tax, and they, all of that brings with it its own <laughs> challenges. But um, I, I do think is a certain amount of um, uh, it, it's sort of it, it's the same discussion I have with clients when they come in and they say, "Listen, I want to uh, I want to have an estate freeze." You know, it's like, "Well, wait a minute, take a deep breath. You are literally losing control, and uh, no matter how hard you try, you are going to lose a level of control that you never had, that you never even imagined, and you don't know how your kids are going to behave, and you certainly don't know how your, um, uh, more importantly, you don't know how your kids." spouses or significant others are going to behave and you don't know where the pressure is going to come from. Um, I do find so much is driven by tax at, at first instance that, you know, as, as lawyers, it's, uh, it's interesting because the statistics are clear that only less than 10%, well, around 10%, 10 to 15% of people decide to give to charity on the basis of the tax benefit. Uh, but uh, well over half of the statistics are uh, well over half of people decide to transfer their properties uh, for um, purposes of what they think are going to be a tax benefit. And uh, I, I do think there's a certain amount of um, obligation on our part to walk through with our clients just what is actually going to be saved here. There is no guarantee that you're going to save anything on the tax side and you're certainly going to lose control. Uh, so those discussions are crucial, and um, and you know the, the, the point of today's webinar really is is that there's lots of options. It's going to fit different people. Uh, an outright gift might work. Uh, it might just make sense. And the family around the, everyone saying, look, this makes sense. Johnny uses the cottage. I don't use the cottage. And if you're going to give the cottage to Johnny, that's great. Uh, we have another client of ours who's just sold their cottage after many years of ownership and they've decided to sell it now because like you said Jordy it, it wasn't worth the headache of trying to figure out how they have a large family how they were going to split it up and um, and, the, and the family didn't need the money they weren't using the cottage as much some of the kids were using it more than others uh, the parents didn't need the money they just didn't need the family tension uh, and the headache, you know, it's a burden to have a property that you, you know, you, something you got to get someone to go fix it and so on. The fridge is broken or the roof is leaking. So um, they just sold it. And, and, and what would, and I did, you know, I, I threw it out as an option, but I didn't, and obviously it was their choice. But I said, look, think about it. If you don't, you're selling it because you want to lift the burden off your shoulders. That's a great idea. But think about what are you going to do with the money? Because you might be able to alleviate some of the stress that you're feeling that some people uh, aren't going to have access to a cottage when you maybe distribute some of that money after tax money to your kids now and let them enjoy it and let them use that money to go rent a place or to go to a resort once a year. Uh, instead of, sorry? You said, was that advice you just gave to your mother? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Distribute I did, money I did, to your kids I know my mother's uh, down the hall, and she's, uh, she's uh, living. She she lives in fear every day. She walks by the stairs with me around, but uh, the 
the uh, no, it's true. The, the the idea of getting rid of the uh, you know the burden off a parent's shoulders pre death is something that is another option. I always like to contr- you know have that discussion with my clients, and then say, and by the way, you're going to be doing something nice too. Uh, because the reality is, is that the, you're tying up a lot of money, and we heard from Peter Lillico's statistics. You're tying up a lot of money during your lifetime for a property that maybe was was great when people were younger, but maybe not so great now to to, to tie it up. And and kids may need the uh, not need, but could use really enjoy the, the the funds now as opposed to later when you die. So uh, that's another aspect of this that is a I would call a non-legal uh, non-substantive uh, issue but something that's worth uh, discussing with the client and and having that you know that that option on your your check off that option in your box um, just in terms of the agreement I just wanted to come back to some of the things that are dealt with in that agreement are also things that you want to consider if you're not going to do an agreement with regard to any transfer of the property, I mean, what if one of your children becomes incapacitated or what if there's, um, you know, one of your children become uh, bankrupt, you know, those sorts of scenarios are, are you know, real and, and possible. And so, you know, to extent that you put these children into a joint ownership situation, you have brought a partner into the deal that even if you haven't done a co-ownership agreement, you've brought a partner into the deal that you may have to deal with on a level that you can't even, well, you can predict, but you can't, you hadn't necessarily thought through. Um, so those are other, you know, other elements of it. I always want, want the clients to understand. It's not just a lack of control. It's a lack of control by third parties. Yeah. And, and I mean, what you what you sometimes see in um, with share with the corporations is you know you say you get the shares uh, if you enter into a shareholders agreement. Um, you could use a similar technique for cottage ownership. I'm giving the cottage to the three of you, um, uh, not in a trust or anything like that. But it's all conditional on the three of you uh, signing this uh, uh, cohabitation or this cohabitation co tenancy uh, agreement. You know. Um, one has to think through what the ramifications of that uh, uh, are, because if one kid doesn't want to sign it, uh, what happens? And you have all those different options. Uh, so if you say, oh, well, then you got to sell it. Well, that means that each of them has a trigger to sell them, force the other ones to sell it. So that's uh, one has to think through the dynamics there. Yeah, it's a veto uh, right by someone who can be difficult. Yeah. So. All right. Well, look, that's um, that's a great uh, uh, sort of overview of, of, of an important issue. Uh, we just spent a couple minutes, and Jordy, I just wanted to talk about some of the uh, tools that you've uh, started to consider and adapt in terms of um, shortcuts and ways to um, eliminate uh, repetitive or mistaken uh, entries into will drafting that, uh, with regard to uh, uh, e-state and, and why I, I do that I say this is that the the drafting uh, of uh, wills and uh, powers of attorney can be something that obviously uh, mistakes can happen on the, it's, it's garbage in garbage out and um, uh, one of the things that um, we don't want to do and I, and I say this I raise this because this week has come up on a case where it's become a really big problem and that was a will that was done in the 60s and we can't get an affidavit of uh, execution done uh, so how important it is to make sure that the affidavit execution is done at the time of execution and what are some of the shortcuts that you've started to create to allow that to happen uh, easier and, and more fluidly so that it makes sure that the document is created at the time of the will. Um, I, I'm wondering if, uh, Jordy, you had any thoughts on that and some of the tools that you're using to help uh, encourage that while we wind up the, today's the webinar. Yeah, just uh, this is a new feature that we have um, because uh, it was a bit of a problem to get affidavits of execution. So now when you generate um, a will, uh, we generate a will using eState, you can uh, include the affidavit of execution. You can have the witnesses plugged in uh, for your will. So they appear in the will and in the affidavit of, of execution. <laughs> Excuse me. Typically, I don't include an affidavit from both witnesses. Um, I do one, just one of the witnesses, uh, an affidavit of execution, but 
Uh, if you wanted one from each of the two witnesses, you could do du dual um, affidavits as well. Um, and then uh, setting the date of the affidavit and the commissioner. Um, and um, then the good news is at that point, everything is generated um, at the same time without having to retype information, get names spelled incorrectly, um, things like that. And so that's where uh, what we've tried to do to make things sort of simpler for um, me on East State. Um, and so that's uh, that's what we've got. And so it pops up with the affidavits of execution um, for that particular will. Um, and it has the names right. And, and the good news is that the names match exactly to the will. So that's one, if anybody's ever tried to submit an affidavit of execution, and the name of the testator is actually slightly different because in the will, it's, they've got an also known as, or they've got a a different spelling. Um, this eliminates that. And then here's, you know, it's all plugged in and with the date and the commissioner and all of that. So that's important because, uh, you know, Ian, about the hassles that, that occur when um, when you don't have an affidavit of execution. And um, uh, despite the, you know, the presumption of due execution with a testimonial clause, um, you still have that, that issue. Yeah, and chasing the affidavit execution, as I say, I've got a, a, a sort of a, an acute problem with mine. But the um, uh, you know creating the document at the same time as the will uh, is, is sometimes uh, missed, or if we're rushing along and trying to get things done quickly. Uh, so uh, it's nice to have it created right at the same time as the will itself, and as you say, accurately reflecting the date of the will, the name of the uh, witnesses, and the uh, Commissioner is a, is a nice little bonus. So, all right. Well, look. I think we've uh, covered a, a, a pretty heavy topic today with um, cottage uh, transfers, and then uh, some recent updates on your end. Uh, just so everyone knows, we're just coming into a bit of a holiday season, and it's going to be hard for us to pull together every uh, webinar every Friday. So, we'll announce the webinars as they go throughout the uh, summer. Um, next week we can't do it. I, uh, both myself and uh, Susanna, have a commitment that we have to attend to right at uh, quarter to nine. So uh, we're uh, not going to be able to have it next week. And so uh, we'll uh, announce on the website and send out a notice when we're coming back on. But thanks everyone for joining us through COVID, and we're uh, we're going to be there with you through COVID. Obviously, you can reach out to any of us anytime, um, and we'll be back uh, on a weekly or regular weekly basis uh, shortly. So. Good luck in the summer, and hopefully everyone stays safe. And Jordy, thanks for your help today. Pleasure. Take care, everyone.